So we're going to talk about the sequential intercept model for a half hour. I've never given the sequential intercept model speech in less than 45 minutes, so uh, I'm going to pick and choose what I'm going to, what I'm going to highlight. Uh, basically, the sequential intercept model breaks up the criminal justice system into five distinct areas. So, um, and I'm going to, I'm going to really focus on the front end of the justice system and the back end of the criminal justice system. Uh, and you know, we'll talk about courts and diversion, the middle parts a little bit. But I really want to focus on front end and back end because there's an awful lot going on now. And there's an awful lot that, uh, going on in those areas that affects peers. Peers are more and more and more across the board becoming really primary, uh, primary partners and uh, participants in, in diversion programs. So this should su surprise nobody, right? <clears throat> in, um, over the past 10 years, there's been a war on everything, right? There's been, the, and there's been a war on drugs and a war on crime and a war on violent crime. And all these wars have resulted in an increase of people in the justice system. Now, there's a lot of innocence in this war, right? There's a lot of people that end up in the correction system that really didn't need to be there. But nevertheless, they're there. And if you look... Um, uh, at the bottom, this is the, the bottom line here is the increase in the jail population, that green line. Red line is the state prison population. But if you note, the top two lines shows the increase of the community supervision population in this country over the past 10 years. Probation and parole. There are a lot of people, a number of people under probation and correctional Super, uh, probation and parole supervision that are involved in the, in the justice system. And, and so probation and parole are key partners at keeping people from being incarcerated and involved in the community. But that's been what, what's been going on actually for a 20-year period now. As you can see, though, things are starting to level off and they're starting to come down. Communities are getting a lot smarter. First of all, they just can't afford it. I mean, state budgets are breaking uh, uh, with uh, their incarceration costs. And I know it's been an issue here in Nebraska. You have a prison system that's at or near capacity. Uh, you're looking at expanding and building jails and regionalizing jails and trying to figure out uh, how, to, um, how to manage the, the, the uh, incarceration of, of folks. And the sequential intercept model presents an opportunity for communities to take a step back and say, well, what can we do to prevent that incarceration, minim minimize penetration in the first place? So let's look at that. So some of the opportunities is that there's a Smarter Sentencing Act that's, that's this was, comes from a New York Times editorial, Smarter Sentencing Act that's going to take a, a fresh look at mandatory minimums. So that's going on nationally. There's the Recidivism Reduction and Public Safety Act. Uh, that's, a, that's an act that's going to look at um, people who are already incarcerated, giving them a chance to get early release and back into the community sooner, and back, back into less uh, expensive forms of supervision. And there's been some pretty good research about what those forms of supervision should be and how people should be triaged into those supervision. So I think people are feeling like you can do this safely, and I think you can. Uh, since 2000, 29 states have moved back have moved to cut back on mandatory sentencing. There's a momentum to get away from that, from that 80s, 90s mentality of incarcerate every problem you can't figure out. So, and especially for the low level and nonviolent drug offenders. And Nebraska's been struggling with these issues, right? So I, I, there's a program, it's called the Unicameral Update. You can, you can look at what the legislation is that is being considered. So I got a few copies of those. Medicaid expansion is being considered. You know, I know it's not a done deal here in Nebraska, but nevertheless, it's a conversation, and it's an important conversation to have because at least it forces uh, the, the conversation about where where are your priority groups and who who should at least a triaging of who are the priority groups and who who really needs the most help and where can we be most efficient in providing those services. There's legislators looking at earned eligibility for those. So for the offenders that are already in prison. Well, let's not let them go to the end of their time. There's not a lot of production, uh, pr productivity out of just continued incarceration. Let's set some incentives up so while they're in prison, they're doing things, they're taking programs that are going to help them when they get out of, get out of jail in, in prison. And if they do, then we'll shorten their prison sentence. This is smart corrections. And so uh, Nebraska's having these conversations. And the one that most caught my eye 
was uh, one of your senators, and I don't remember his, the name, uh, again, wanting to look at, uh, I think the quote was, we can't brick and mortar our way out of this situation, right? So you've, we've got to look at some community alternatives and recognize the special needs of people with mental illness. And so he proposes a voucher program because the Medicaid expansion is not a done deal. And even if it was, there would be problems. Um, but the vo a voucher system so that when people are coming out of the state prisons, they have vouchers to purchase services and they can get medication the day that they get released and they can get services the day they can get, the, the day they get released and uh, so that uh, there, there's, people aren't um, sent out alone without adequate support. So there are states that have used this voucher system with, with great success. So I was happy to see that because the danger is without some specific, with, with these initiatives going on and implemented, without some specific attention to the needs of a person with mental illness, they'll either get left in prison, they won't earn those earned eligibility uh, certificates in the first place, or even if they did, they wouldn't have the, the supports that they need to be successful in the community and they'd be violated quickly. So uh, there really needs to be a mental health component to all this planning, which is very sound, but unless there's a mental health component to it, unless, uh, unless you as peers are speaking up and the mental health association is doing work and involved in those kinds of uh, issues, and I've heard discussion about um, Kia House. <laughs> Kia. Kia House, I got it, thank you. Uh, being, starting to get involved in these things. These are great things. There's, there's great momentum, and I think there's great opportunity here. But voices need to be heard. So what are the prevalence rates, rates of, people, uh, of people with mental illness in prison? So <clears throat> there are um, policy research, the group I work for, uh, went into five jails, two in Maryland and two, two in New York. And we looked at people with serious mental illness. We wanted to know uh, people who had the most uh, disabling illnesses, depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, and what the prevalence rate, rate was. And we wanted to know the last month prevalence rate, not the, not the lifetime prevalence rate, so we could have an idea of what the acute needs of a, of a jail population were. And what we found was that 14.5% uh, of the men and 31.7% of the women percent of the women had a serious mental illness. Now, you, you can argue about what's the importance of prevalence rates. I mean, some of you may have heard that there's 50% of the people in jails and prisons have mental health problems. And so that was a study that was done by BJS, uh, the you know, Bureau of Justice Statistics. And so they, you, you scored as having a mental health problem if you, had, if, you, if you responded yes to, do you have insomnia? Well, very often jail inmates have insomnia, so that there were a lot of people that said yes. Do you have thoughts of revenge? Well, very often there are people in jail that will have thoughts of revenge from time to time. So it was really a broad, broad diagnostic category, so, which isn't to say that those aren't important issues to address, but we really wanted to look at what the serious rates of serious mental illness is, that, because that's a group that you really need to target resources for. And it, it's, a, it's a number we think that really helps uh, communities estimate uh, what resources have to be brought to bear. <clears throat> so, when we go into communities and we, and, we, and we start talking to them about the criminal justice program, it's a little bit like the blind man and the elephant. We know, you know that somebody can describe the trunk really well, the front end, some people can describe reentry pretty well, and they know what happens at that end, but nobody really takes a step back to take a look at how things flow across the system. Where is there duplication of services? Where are there huge gaps that nobody saw? So what was developed uh, uh, to help communities do that, uh, get that broad perspective, is something called the sequential intercept model. And this was developed by uh, Dr. Patty Griffin and Dr. Mark Munitz. Dr. Griffin is a psychologist out of Philadelphia, and Dr. Munitz, a psychiatrist in Ohio, and they developed this sequential intercept model for the, for the gain center. So what, what the sequential intercept model does, as I said, is it divides the, the uh, criminal justice system into five distinct intercepts. The first one is police crisis in crisis services. The second is the arraignment uh, court, so somebody gets arrested and they move into uh, the jail and then they have their first appearance. Uh, can people be diverted? Can services be brought to somebody at that first arraignment court so they don't have to penetrate further into the system? The third intercept is intercept three. So somebody's in jail, bail hasn't been set, they're waiting and waiting and waiting for trial. And, 
um, in uh, specialty courts where there's more long-term uh, diversion. So specialty courts can include drug courts, veterans courts, those kinds of courts, or just normal disposition, you know, uh, just going through your regular uh, criminal process, uh, judicial process. And then intercept four is reentry, coming out of jail or coming out of prison. It's another important engagement point. If there are services there, when somebody is, is coming out and reentering into the community. And the last intercept, again, very important, is, is the probation parole intercept. Uh, as you remember that very first slide, that numbers of people uh, in any community, that most of the people with mental health issues, behavioral health issues, are going to be under parole, probation, supervision. People under pro pro with mental illness under probation, parole, supervision do worse. They have more technical violations. So again, uh, having the right kinds of services at that intercept, partnerships with probation can reduce reentry into the into the prison system. So intercept one. <clears throat> The key players here, of course, are law enforcement uh, and dispatch. Now, in the very, very best communities, diversion starts when the call comes in to dispatch. There are protocols in place to do a better job at identifying who's calling, uh, to identify mental health issues, to identify and this is becoming a much larger issue in communities across the country, whether somebody's a veteran or not. So that the police, now, you know, the police know, law enforcement knows, knowledge, knowledge is, 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 uh, is power. Knowledge is, is, a, is a, it's another bullet in the gun, really, in terms of being able to uh, be prepared when you're going out on the street to a call. So the more information, the more structured the information dispatch collect, connects, the better informed the police officer is when he gets to the scene. So, uh, so diversion really should start there, but a lot of dispatch uh, uh, um, units <clears throat> don't get the training they need. They, they, they're excluded from a lot of the mental health training. So if you're doing these kinds of programs locally, it's important to remember to include 9-11 dispatch. So there's basically three models of police-based of, 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 cri of crisis diversion in Intercept 1. The first is uh, something that you're familiar with here uh, in uh, Nebraska, it's the police-based crisis intervention teams. So uh, again, so in order for CIT, crisis intervention team international to um, credit you with uh, having a CIT team, it's a 40-hour training. And a key component of that training, how many have ever in this, in this room have ever uh, participated in a CIT training, been part of a panel, one, two, Okay, so a handful of people have, so you're familiar with, with it. And how important that consumer perspective is to the police and how, you know, when you've been, I wish this was a smaller room, we'd have a discussion about that. But when you've been, but when you, when you've been with, with, with police and how their attitudes begin to change after hearing your stories, how uh, some of the comments they may have made earlier in the training, all of a sudden they start to become more sensitive and they're listening more. It's very powerful training. It, uh, I've had other, I was at a, a training in, uh, I was at a CIT conference in Ohio and there was a woman uh, 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 managing the resource booth and I was talking to her. And so she said that she was a special ed teacher uh, from a community in Ohio. I said, well, why are you at the CIT conference? She said, well, my husband's a CIT officer. I said, I know, but why are you here? And so she said, well, you know, my husband got sent to, got sent to CIT training. I think it was like going to be his rehabilitation program. And, um, and she said, I can't believe how it changed him as a husband. And then he came, and then he came to my, and then he, he would come home telling me all these great stories, and I started crying. And she, he said to me, well, why are you crying? He said, because I wish, the, I wish the teachers in my school had this training. The way they treat the kid, because she was a special ed teacher, the way, she, the way they treat the kids is awful. And I'm constantly fighting for them to have a better understanding, create more flexibility. So my kids aren't getting sent to the principal all the time. So he went to the school and trained the teachers. The concept, and it, you know, when you, when you talk about CIT, and for those of you who have been, it's about the things we've been talking about. It's trauma-informed training. It's respect for pe people. It's listening. It's what happened to you. 
not what's wrong with you. It's all those things. And so the, those things are, you know, the, the, the programs now in, that law enforcement is, are, are doing are very helpful in the consumer partnerships and also uh, the partnerships with National Alliance for Mentally Ill in terms of uh, working with the police. NAMI has been a great leader in terms of expanding CIT throughout the country. So that's, that's one model, police crisis intervention teams. There's also a co-responder model where the police will go out, they may not have the CIT training, training or they may, but a mental health provider will, will go out with them. Mobile crisis team worker will go out with them to respond to the scene. It's a very effective model. In fact, you know, um, uh, that uh, so, some communities use both models. And, uh, and, and Lincoln and, and Omaha, I think, may use both models. They have a co-response. Again, a very effective model. Some um, communities don't have mobile, don't have trained police, and so it'll be just mobile crisis that'll respond. And that's a problem because most mobile crisis teams around the country are underfunded. They're not 24/7 operations, uh, and so there's times when there, there's there's a lack of coverage and, and a lack of response. So, so that's an issue. But those are basically the three models of law enforcement response. We know that CIT, from a number of uh, program evaluations, have been successful in Memphis. In Memphis uh, the Memphis Police Department reports a 40% decrease in injuries and, re and reduced use of SWAT. Albuquerque reports fewer than 10% of people with mental illness are arrested when they respond to calls. Miami-Dade was interesting. Miami-Dade, they, you know, they started a CIT team, and what their, uh, their uh, city council noticed is they stopped getting sued. So they funded more CIT teams. So that was like a no-brainer for Miami-Dade. And again, Las Vegas, and probably one of the best studies on Las Vegas uh, on uh, CIT was done in Las Vegas, where they saw that officers use more appropriate use of force and reduced injuries to cities, to, uh, to citizens and police. So again, there's an evidence base for CIT uh, initiatives. Now the problem is in many communities is you know you 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 train your police officers. They've done this 40-hour training. They're all jazzed up about the services in the community, and then they they uh, they'll, they'll go out to a call and they'll bring somebody to the emergency room. Um, so, uh, are there law enforcement in this room? Do you do you face any of these issues? Per now, it doesn't make it doesn't it's not committed, but it's a behavior problem. This is the wrong. Now, this is the wrong person for us. It's a medical problem, it's not a psychiatric problem. You've got to bring them over to another facility for medical. It's more substance abuse, not mental illness. Bring them over to detox. And so, um, quickly, there's a lot of frustration unless services around at this particular uh, intercept are coordinated. So, <clears throat> I just came from Washington, D.C. The, there was the National Council of Community Behavioral Health had a pre-conference works, workshop on crisis response strategies. More and more across the country, you know, states are recognizing that there's just not going to be more beds. There's going to continue to be a bed crisis, even for acute, even for acute people who need acute care. And so uh, there really now is become, becoming to be kind of a, uh, more of a science uh, to uh, the different components of what constitutes a comprehensive crisis uh, care approach. And I'm going to talk about some of these things because it's really emerging and states are starting to invest heavily uh, in, in, in some of these strategies. So just uh, to give you an idea, Texas uh, has developed a crisis redesign initiative and over the past three years funding, now Texas is a pretty conservative state. Their mental health system, their generic mental health system is badly under, underfunded. Uh, they're not an ACA state, I don't think. Uh, if, they, if, they, if they are, they were, I don't think they are. No, it's Rick Perry. He would never be. But <clears throat> $111 million they funded for crisis services that they put out to the community for things like crisis stabilization units, observation units, increased mobile crisis teams, better CIT training, and those kinds of things. $111 million from Texas. Uh, Washington has, uh, has had a crisis redesign initiative uh, for a number of years. Now, Washington did a really neat thing. We were out there to do some strategic planning with them. And uh, the, the, their NAMI person, Jim Adams, did not like the sequential intercept model. He said, that starts too late. Why do you have to wait until somebody's arrested before you start thinking about diversion? I want a prevention model. So he, he just dug his teeth in. And what he got out of, out of the law that established these crisis stabilization units is he broadened the, the uh, discretion of police officers. He basically decriminalized misdemeanors for people with mental, mental illness. So that if a person with mental illness is uh, 
charged with a misdemeanor, the, the, the written charge still goes to the DA where it, where it stays pending, but then the referral is to one of these crisis stabilization units and, and, and to link uh, people for services. North Carolina is looking at improving their crisis stabilization. Virginia, you know, has had a number of tragic incidents, you know, uh, right from Virginia Tech on up to uh, uh, their, their senator uh, whose son was uh, committed suicide. So they've got a lot of money on the street to improve uh, their crisis services and develop crisis stabilization units, as does California and, and Denver. So I've, I've reviewed all those proposals, I've reviewed all those, 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 uh, those legislative initiatives, and I, and I went to the community, uh, the crisis uh, response uh, seminar uh, a couple weeks ago, and this is what I've distilled now in terms of what some of the best practices are. And people who actually do this work may disagree with me, but it's just from, from my reading the, the, different, uh, the different proposals and initiatives that, that are out there. And New York also actually just in their past uh, a legislative session passed a number of crisis stabilization initiatives. So there's the ER diversion. You know, and I know that uh, there's some of that that's going on in Nebraska already, peer, using peer support navigators. So the first person a person in crisis sees coming into emergency room is, uh, is a peer navigator, peer support, welcoming the person into the services. And it makes all the difference in the world, not only for the person coming in, but also how the staff will respond after that. So um, crisis stabilization, 16 beds, if it's over 17 beds, it becomes an institution for mental disease, I and mean, it affects funding issues, so 16 bed crisis stabilization units, the length of stay of three to five days. Another component, crisis residential, which is a longer le length of stay, 10 to 14 days. Crisis respite, length of stay 30 days, transition residential. So again, multiple steps. Uh, de depending on what the acuity is and the crisis level of the person. But and infused through all these programs is peer response. Increase in mobile crisis and police co-response services. 24-7 urgent care walk-in. It's a critical, there are too many communities that are waiting lists for people uh, to, uh, to, to be seen. And urgent care walk-in, a number of communities are providing that. Uh, you know, you can do that for a health issue. You've got an urgent care, you have to go to the emergency room. It's cheaper to go to urgent care. Uh, but that hasn't been a concept that's really been, you know, it, it, services are underfunded so that they haven't had that urgent care. Now with the establishment of health homes and some of the health reform, the, the, it's bringing in and upgrading, I think, uh, so that there's real parity about how behavioral health issues are resolved as, as well as health issues. So I think that's, that's why I think this really is a good time to be having meetings like this and talking about what some of the best practices are moving forward. Now you're saying, why is this guy from New York have a slide on Kia House? We know we have Kia House. What's he, what's, why is he having it? Right, and the LPD referral program, right, that we heard about yesterday, the, that work, work with the police department. I have these two slides here because I'm here to tell you, you have to tell other people about this program. This is a gem. People around, there, you know, uh, New York has some of these, one or two, you know, we don't, we don't have a lot. Around the country, uh, these, the, uh, peer respite is still a new concept. Uh, peers working with police, I'll bet there's just a handful of communities that are doing that. These are programs you have to talk to people about. You have to write about them, look at, look at journals and newsletters, and, and get the message out. Not only that, it's good marketing for you. Because people like a winner, and I and you got a winner with this, so that's why it's here. So, I'm, like like I said, I'm going to go through these these next slides pretty quickly. Intercept two is the first. So somebody's gone into jail. They police couldn't divert. They uh, bail doesn't get set generally because the person has mental illness, doesn't have a place to stay, so they're going to jail. You know, it's. it's uh, and, but if you've got a diversion program, you've got a case manager sitting in that courtroom and you've done the appropriate screening, maybe you can get that person to a treatment program instead of having them go to jail simply because they're poor, which basically is what happens with that. And it happens more often with mental illness than it does with other people. So screening's important. Your big, your big uh, partners in screening here are the public defender, the defense bar, uh, pretrial services, if there's pretrial in the area. Of course, your jail intake person, if, if, you know, jail intake generally is, does a person have a mental health issue, let's get them treatment. But you can put a diversion person in there and say, um, 
oh wait, this person meets a diversion criteria, call the judge, look, we can get a program for them in 24 hours, let's get them out. You have a question? Yeah, I'm wondering if... Well, yeah, exactly. And, and <clears throat> that's why these partnerships are so important, so that when this happens, you have a system that's ready to respond and do the advocacy that's necessary. So maybe if they refuse to accept them, there's another alternative. But, but here, here's the thing is, people do this work, and, the peer, and, what's, and uh, Ronnie, yeah, Ronnie Wilder knows this. You never take no for an answer. So uh, database matching is, is very big now, too, so, so that uh, the just, when somebody gets arrested, you send that database over to your, your mental health database, you identify somebody who, who's, uh, that you're taking care of that's gotten arrested, you respond within 24 hours to make sure there's a linkage. So there's a lot of database linking that's going on, too. This is a brief jail mental health screen, which uh, uh, you, you can find on our website. It's, it's, it's good for jails and probation departments to begin to identify people with mental illness. Um, this is a fact sheet which uh, you have out here, uh, in, uh, uh, which talks about uh, uh, screening of veterans, uh, people who have been in the military, so that they can be identified quickly and diverted. So now we're in intercept three, uh, where you have more long-term kinds of uh, incarceration, and you're going through a process. Generally, you're in felony, felony uh, charges, but sometimes it's misdemeanor, and it takes weeks and weeks and weeks to resolve for, for various reasons. I'm not going to do that slide. So across the, uh, we, we think there are about, we've done surveys, we think that maybe there's about 346 mental health courts across the country, 166 veterans courts across the country now, about 1,400 drug courts. So there's a lot of specialty courts already. But the one thing that you have to be aware of when you're designing any diversion program, especially if it's going to be a, uh, uh, a specialty court, are the collateral sanctions. Uh, Often we work in, the, in a community and they're very, very proud of their, of their mental health courts. But then you start looking at the mental health courts and then they're all, you have to plead guilty to get into them. Well, that's going to exclude a lot of people whose public defender won't let them plead guilty and who shouldn't let them plead guilty. But nevertheless, they'll be diverted then to traditional processing, which, you know, is, uh, it's, it's just a crapshoot. So you what really want to... You want the, the, the DAs, you want the judges, you want the public defenders to be aware of what these collateral consequences are if there's a guilty plea, because it affects them, as people know, right? I don't have to sell this group, I don't think. It affects employment, it affects ho housing, it can affect voting rights, dri driver's license, food stamps. Also, the multiple fines that can be collected. You know, people get arrested in a, in a number of different venues very often, and sometimes their quality of life, and they don't incarcerate, they fine you. But if you're living on disability or, you've got, or, or you're homeless, these fines can be crushing, suffocating. So it's important for the, for, to figure out strategies to combine some of these fines and have them forgiven in some instances, but develop strategies to address these collateral consequences. Any one of these slides could be a 45-minute lecture in and of itself, but I just kind of want to give you the flavor of the important things that you need to take care of. So now we're into intercept four, which is reentry. So coming out of prison and jail, it's critically important to make connections with behavioral health providers at, um, at this juncture because a study was done out, out of the uh, state of Washington. Post-release risk of death, they looked at 30,000 inmates getting out of uh, Washington state prisons. What they found was 443 died during the average follow-up year uh, 1.9. That was three and a half times the death rate of the general population. That within the first two weeks of release, the death rate was 13 times higher for inmates with serious mental illness. 13 times higher. Re-entry planning is a matter of life and death. Your legislature needs to know that. Drug overdose was one of the leading, you know, we talked about trauma. With, with this group, and we talked about the current trauma. Remember that high percentage of people with current trauma, dangerous relationships, dangerous uh, environments that they're living in, drug, drug overdose, leading cause of death, heart disease, homicide, and suicide. You have to meet somebody coming out of, out of prison. The minute their foot hits the sidewalk, you cannot miss a second, even jail. Ronnie knows, Ronnie was telling me this. Ronnie Wilder was telling me this. But the minute that they're, they're, uh, they're because you lose them. The, the, they'll gravitate toward old habits, and they need intrusive case management to keep them connected with services. Now, we know a little bit about transition, reentry. I'm going to skip this one. So the, the key to uh, reentry 
planning is starting before they get out. It's the, these in-reach models, and so there's some very good research that shows if you start being connected with people prior to release, you're going to improve your, um, you're going to lower ho one hospital recidivism, lower uh, criminal recidivism, and improve engagement. Uh, that's the summary of these slides. I won't go through all the studies, but basically, you're going to lower hospital recidivism, you're going to improve engagement, you're going to re and you're going to improve um, criminal recidivism. So there's a, there's a, there are smart strategies to do this. What Alaska did, this, this is a, uh, it's called the APIC model, assess, plan, um, <coughs> integrate services, and coordinate. And so the APIC model uh, really was a, was a re-entry model that, uh, that we have a monograph that's on our website that talks about the best strategies for this. And so uh, Alaska took that model and they went to their legislature and said, we want to do a better job at, at re-entry planning for folks. And they used the basis of that model to develop transition funding for people coming out of their state prisons. This, the, these are the domains on that, on that uh, form that you saw. It's a, re, you know, it's a re check off and referral form. So that uh, we look at uh, reentry re holistically. We're looking at the health needs. We're looking at child care needs. We're looking at benefits and all those kinds of things. Because reentry planning is a little bit like putting up Christmas tree lights, right? Everything's in a series circuit. So one light goes out, the whole, like the whole light goes out. One of, these, one, of these, one of these things goes out in a reentry plan, it can, it can co completely collapse your, your reentry plan. So you really have to be comprehensive. Uh, this is to any, any of the case managers in the audience, um, <laughs> peer, peer services. You guys are superheroes. The people who do this work are superheroes. You're the safety net. The system is broken. You guys are the fixers in, in pulling things together all the time. You can't do this work without transition folks, whether they're peer nav navigators or case managers. They have to be there for people. Uh, benefits is incredibly uh, important to do. Uh, because again, if you're coming out, you've got some services, but you can't pay long term for those services, you're not going to be first in line when you get to the clinic. If you don't have, if you don't have uh, Social Security, how are you going to get housing? You know, a lot of the housing dollars are, are supported by the Social Security piece. It takes months to get Social Security. So these are the strategies that states have used to create the country to improve, for the, this is before health care reform, but then for the states that aren't going to do health care reform, there's Medicaid expansion that's going on here, Medicaid suspension so that those that have Medicaid don't get it cut off. Uh, New York funded a medication program for people coming out of, out of jails and prisons. Sometimes uh, legislatures will appropriate money. Nebraska is considering that. That vouchers program is going to be, I hope, a legislative appropriation to, so people can get the services they need during that important transition period. I told you about the APIC program, and I want to tell you about Social Security Outreach Access and Recovery, and then maybe I'll quit, right? Yeah. Well, we'll vote. So, Social Security, if for a Social Security application, first submission, the approval rates around the country are about 20%. Then you go into the appeals process, which takes weeks and weeks and weeks and months and months and months, right? Years. So uh, policy research has a, something called the Social Security Outreach Access Recovery Center. So what it is is it trains case managers, case managers, again, Batman, to, do, uh, to take that Social Security application, assemble all the medical uh, evidence, submit that application so that it gets approved on the first time. Nationally, programs that use the SOAR model get approval somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of the time. 80 and 90 percent of the time. That's money coming into your state. It's, it's, you know, so it's a smart thing to be doing. We implemented a program when I was, at, when I was working in New York State at Sing Sing, and, one, and there's one next door at Oklahoma if you want some technical assistance on it. It's a very effective reach-in model. Uh, people coming in from their DMH into the prisons to do SOAR applications. 89% in, in, at Sing Sing in Oklahoma has got us by 1%, 90%. But again, what that means for an inmate coming uh, out, of, out of prison is that he gets a check the first, full month, the first full month that he's out. You know what that means to a housing provider? All of a sudden they go up to the top of the list. Oh, that happened to us in New York. We would send housing referrals out for folks, right? We never got any interest until we were telling them, well, they'll have Social Security within the first 90 days. Oh, yeah, we'll interview them. You know, we'd set up a video conference. It, it, you'd be surprised how many barriers money reduces. Good. So I'm, I'm going to leave. I'm just. Can I do one more slide? 
People need to know about this because uh, the probation departments are in, and corrections departments are really starting to adapt the risk needs responsivity model. They're starting to do a lot of risk assessment uh, on uh, using uh, instruments like the level of service inventory and, and, and risk assessment instruments because what they found is if you focus your supervision services on people who are high risk, they'll do better. If you focus intense supervision services on people who are low risk, they'll do worse because you undermine their pro-social activities that way. So uh, your probation, probation departments and corrections are really looking at high risk uh, uh, instruments. This is what they're measuring with the high risk. It's, they, they've, we've, they've identified, the criminal justice literature has identified eight central risk factors that are going to lead to people coming back into prison and, and continuing criminal behavior. And if these aren't addressed, the uh, behavior will, be, will continue. So the first four had to do with antisocial behaviors and attitudes. The last four had to do with things that, uh, family and marital uh, uh, relationships, impairment there, school and work, use of leisure and recreation, and of course, substance abuse. So as a provider, if you're working with somebody who's got a number of uh, uh, criminal, uh, criminal charges, a long history of criminal behavior, one of the things that it's important to do is be aware of these activities because unless you're addressing them in the course of your work, and certainly trauma care does also, right? But unless you're addressing these in the course of your work, you'll have people who are criminals with very few symptoms, but they'll still have a lot of criminal behavior. So it's important. And plus, uh, it, when you're working with probation, they're going to be using language like this. And it's, there's going to be a culture clash with it a little bit because you might have other ideas about what causes this behavior, but nevertheless, it's important for providers to begin to become aware with the risk assessment literature. And so I'm going to stop there.